Panorama TV presents Digital Photography One-on-One, -on -One, where we answer your questions. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Digital Photography One-on-One. -on -One. I'm Mark Wallace. Well today we're going to be looking at a topic that a lot of you have been asking about. It's called dynamic range. We're also going to be talking about why sensor size is so important. So let's get started by looking at our question. Dan asked, what is dynamic range? And we also got a very closely related question from Aman. Aman asked, can you explain the makeup of a sensor and how it works? Well, dynamic range is something that can be very technical with lots of fun scientific words, but I'm going to keep it simple and try to make sure that we have knowledge that you can apply. So what is dynamic range? Well, at a very basic level, it's the ratio of light from the very darkest to the brightest that your camera can capture. Well, let's assume something. Let's assume that this graph shows us all of the different levels of light in a scene. There are about 16 stops of light in this graph. Well, our eyes can see about 24 stops of light if we take into account our pupils opening and closing for variations in light levels. And that means our eyes would be able to see every single level of light in this scene from the very darkest to the brightest. But let's assume that our eyes are a little bit more like a camera and they could only make an instantaneous exposure. Well, if that was the case, our eyes could only see about 14 stops of light, which still means we can see almost all of these levels of light. Let's talk about film cameras. They can actually capture 12 stops of light, which is represented by this red square. Well, many photographers love to shoot film because the dynamic range is so large. In fact, digital medium format cameras like a Mamiya or a Hasselblad can also capture 12 stops of light. It's one of the many reasons that professional photographers choose these really expensive cameras. It means they can see almost as much as our eyes can. In contrast, almost all other digital cameras, they, well, they only capture about five stops of light. And that is uh, represented by this little green square. In fact, some cameras can not even capture five stops of light, so it's a very big difference. There's a huge difference between what we can see and what our cameras can capture. Well, to better understand dynamic range, let's take a closer look at a couple of images. Here's an image that I shot, and I shot this at Cannon Beach in Oregon. It's of Haystack Rock. This image has a lot of issues. We can see that Haystack Rock, well, it's very underexposed, and the sky, well, it's overexposed. The camera's dynamic range was too small to capture both the dark areas in the scene and the bright areas of the scene, and what I got, well, it was an image that it wasn't really pleasing. Well, here's another example of an image that has dynamic range problems. This duck here, well, the duck is exposed correctly but the camera's dynamic range was too small to capture any of the detail in the sky because it was too bright. Well, now that we know a little bit about dynamic range and what it is, let me explain how your camera's sensor works, and then we'll talk about ways that we can manage our dynamic, dynamic range to get a little bit more pleasing images. Now, well, many of you have asked what the benefits of a large sensor are. Well, one of the things that a large sensor does, well, it changes the dynamic range of your camera. You might be surprised to know that sometimes it's better to have a large sensor with a smaller resolution than a small sensor with a higher resolution. And the reason for this has to do with the size of the little devices on our sensor that actually gather light. These are commonly referred to as pixels, and in each pixel there's a little cavity, and that cavity is called a photosight. Well, light travels in little bundles of energy, and those bundles of energy are called photons. Now, the photosites on our sensor measure these photons to determine how bright something is. Now, I have a bunch of little chocolate candies here, and each one of these represents a photon. And I also have some bowls here, and each one of these represents a photosite. Now, the larger the photosite is, the more photons it can measure. That means if we have just a few photons, I'll put a few photons in these. Well, and in this instance, we're measuring a, uh, a very dark image. Well, the sensor can measure all of these photons if that's uh, just a few that we're measuring. But if we're measuring something that's a little bit brighter, well, we'd have a lot more photons to measure. Well, let's go back. Let's imagine that we're shooting that Cannon Beach scene in Oregon that I showed you earlier. Well, we'd need to measure some very dark areas. So here's our little dark areas, not very many photons and we need to measure some areas that are a lot brighter. So here's some brighter areas. 
All right, here's the brighter areas. And then we need to measure some areas that are really bright. So here's our really bright areas. Okay, there we go. All right, so you can see a couple of things. You can see that the small bowl, well, it had some difficulty. It wasn't able to capture all of the photons. The medium-sized bowl was able to capture a little bit more, and the large bowl was able to capture all of the photons. Well, once a photosite is full, you know, we call that saturated. In other words, once it's full, it hits its white point, and that means that all of our highlights get blown out much faster with a smaller photosite than with a large photosite. Or that means that we have to change the way we take a picture and we have to measure our light at higher luminances. And that means that we get great highlights like clouds, but our shadows have no detail. So a haystack rock would still be dark. Well, a large photo site captures more photons and therefore it gives your camera a larger dynamic range. You can see more of the shadows and highlights with a larger photo site. Now, if you want larger photo sites on your sensor, you need to either have a very large sensor, like a medium format camera or a full size sensor, or you need to put fewer photo sites on the sensor that you do have. That means that sometimes a camera with lower resolution can produce images that are a little bit nicer than a camera with higher resolution. Well, there's another significant advantage of a large sensor, and that is that your images have less noise. Well, that's because large photo sites are able to do a better job at gathering light and so they produce cleaner images. Well, this is one of the Im uh, reasons that different camera manufacturers have different image sizes. For example, Nikon has two cameras, and both of them have full-size sensors, the Nikon D3X and the D3S. Now, although they have the same size sensor, one of them, the D3S, has larger photo sites, and it behaves better in low light. Well, the D3X has smaller photo sites, but it has more of them. And that means that the resolution is higher and that's great for studio work. Well, you can see the same thing with other camera manufacturers. Mamiya and Hasselblad offer several different digital backs so that you can choose between resolution and pixel size. And that goes down the line with all different brands of camera. Well, now that we know more about dynamic range and our photo sites, let's quickly talk about some ways that we can manage how our camera sees different levels of light. Well, if you want images that have a high dynamic range, you can do a few things. Let's assume that buying a $10,000 camera is out of the picture. So let's talk about some strategies that are a little bit more realistic. Well, one of those strategies is that you can shoot HDR images. Now, HDR stands for high dynamic range. Now, let me show you this little graph. And, and we can talk about how we can shoot these HDR images. To, do, to shoot an HDR images, you need to take several photos of the same scene at different exposure levels. You can see that on this chart, it's represented by these green areas. We would expose for the blacks, the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. Then we take all of those photos, we'd smash them together using Photoshop or some other post-processing software to create the final image. Now, shooting HDR images is something we're going to cover in a future episode. But for right now, if you really want to get started, there are a bunch of articles at the Adorama Learning Center that will show you how to do this step by step. Well, there's a different strategy, and that is you can change the time of day that you shoot. Well, here's an image of a hotel sign that I shot a few years ago. It's not a very good picture. And you can see that the sky doesn't have any detail because of where the sun is. It's a little bit overexposed in the image. Well, it's just really boring. So what I did is I just came back a few hours later when the sun had gone down, and what I got was a much more pleasing image because the actual levels of light in the scene in real life, well, there weren't as many of them, so my camera was able to capture all of that, and we got a lot more detail, a lot more color, and it looks a lot better when I came back a little bit later on. Well, another popular strategy is to compress the dynamic range, and you can do that by adding light to dark areas and you can do that using a flash. Here's an image that I shot of a model, and you can see that the sky, it's properly exposed, but our model, well, she's too dark. Well, I could have done a few things. I could have overexposed the background. I didn't want to do that, and so instead of overexposing the background, I just added a little light by using a flash, and I brightened up our model, and you can see that looks much better and that she looks great. Now, to understand how to do this, you can watch episode 20 of Digital Photography One-on-One. -on -one. It has all kinds of information on how to use a flash to balance ambient light with the flash and compress your dynamic range. You can also use filters to darken portions of a scene. It's sort of the opposite of using a flash. 
but unfortunately, we don't have time to go into that in this episode. In fact, we're out of time for this episode, but I hope you've learned a little bit about dynamic range. Well, don't forget, please check out the Adorama Learning Center for those HDR articles so you can start shooting those. Or if you have more questions about dynamic range or really questions about anything about photography, you can send those to me at askmark at adorama.com. Well, thanks for joining me. I'll see you again next week. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.